These people all made scamming a lifestyle. Let's check out all of their crimes, starting with... Number six, Scambo for a Lambo. Lee Price III fraudulently obtained over $1 million from COVID relief funds designed to provide financial relief to small businesses impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Rather than use the money to bail out his so-called businesses, Price instead bought a Lamborghini worth $233,000, a Ford F-350 pickup truck valued at eighty-five dollars a $14,000 Rolex watch, and other extravagant items. He also burned through thousands of dollars at clubs, supporting various young ladies who pretended to like him for a few hours. Price received $1.6 million after applying for loans with the Payment Protection Program and filed applications with two lenders for three companies, 713 Construction LLC, Price Enterprise Holdings LLC, and Price Logistics Services LLC. He received almost half the amount he initially requested, $2.6 million. He lied about the number of people he employed and their payroll taxes in his paperwork. Almost everything he reported was a lie. Price had at least a 14-year criminal history when he filed the fraudulent forms with a large stack of mugshots to prove his prior arrests. Unfortunately, Price wasn't the only person to take advantage of the government program. The U.S. Justice Department's Fraud Division has been very busy over the past few years uncovering a number of people who lied to receive funds. The division has prosecuted over 150 defendants in over 95 criminal cases and seized over $75 million in funds. Price pleaded guilty to charges of wire fraud and money laundering. Additionally, federal authorities seized $700,000 worth of Price's money and fraudulent goods. He was sentenced to nine years in prison. Price can now name himself as CEO of Cell Block D. Number five, the X-Files. John Mulder, a man from Ontario, Canada, assumed multiple identities to meet women online and scam them out of thousands of dollars. Mulder repeatedly changed his life story, name, and profession, and the justice system struggled to keep up with him for years. Despite multiple charges over the years, he was able to evade the consequences of his actions. Mulder's multiple aliases, Johnny Myers, Johnny Mayers, John Boulder, and John Mulders, helped him stay ahead of law enforcement. Many of Mulder's victims were lonely single mothers who were taken by his charming and engaging personality. Mulder claimed to have a variety of careers, such as managing high-profile country artists, making money repairing and flipping motorcycles, and pretending to be a veterinarian. One of his victims was Naomi Wolf, whom he met on Facebook Marketplace when she bought a $10,000 motorcycle from him. Wolf fell for Mulder, and the pair started dating. At the beginning of their eight-month relationship, Mulder was as charismatic and fun as he was with all his victims. However, However, as the relationship grew, the engaging and easy-to-talk-to version of Mulder disappeared and he became controlling. The relationship ended and Wolf was suspicious of the person she once loved. She discovered he had lied about most of his life and that she wasn't his only victim. Mulder's victims formed a Facebook page entitled, quote, Are We Dating the Same Man, Toronto? where they shared his pictures and commented on how he deceived them. The platform helped the women piece together his fraudulent schemes and share their experiences. It was clear to Wolf that Mulder had bamboozled her. She even discovered that the motorcycle she bought from him actually belonged to Ange Medill, another of Mulder's victims. Mulder initially offered to sell Medill the motorcycle in question, but he never gave Medill the money or returned the bike. The motorcycle was far from the only lie he told. Mulder misled his victims into thinking he had many jobs and would reinvent himself repeatedly. One woman, Amy Todd, believed Mulder imported and maintained horses, and she invested $60,000 into a phony business venture with him. Law enforcement had been aware of Mulder's fraudulent activities, and he faced multiple charges over the years, such as fraud, unlawful confinement, mischief, and voyeurism. Mulder was arrested in 2013 and charged with fraud after he 
pretended to be a veterinarian to meet and defraud women online. After being convicted, Mulder served 683 days in prison. Upon his release, Mulder faced a string of new charges and failed to appear in court for most of them. Although he amassed multiple bench warrants for his arrest, Mulder posted bail and didn't let silly things like warrants deter him from scamming single mothers. Mulder had continuously changed his name and identity, making it hard for law enforcement to catch him. Although part of the problem was that they didn't really seem to take Mulder's actions seriously, making it difficult for his victims to seek justice. Mulder ultimately couldn't hide from his multiple bench warrants. After failing to attend another court date in October 2022, Mulder was arrested and charged with another round of unlawful confinement, mischief, and voyeurism charges. Basically, this dude has over 100 pissed off exes. Good luck with that, Mulder. Number four, not the primary. Stuart Pearman attempted to steal millions of dollars left for charity by pretending to be the primary beneficiary of an elderly friend's will. After his friend passed away, Pearman forged a fake letter of wishes, which he presented to solicitors in 2016, to gain control over her multi-million dollar fortune. Pearman had been friends with the victim for 25 years, and she intended to donate a multi-million sum of money to an air ambulance charity. However, Pearman altered her will to make himself the sole executor and main beneficiary since he apparently needed the money more than people who needed emergency rescue. The victim had already set aside money for Pearman, which was an already generous $31,220, but that wasn't enough for Mr. Spoiled Brat. After he tampered with her will, Pearman stated he stood to inherit $2.7 million. The deceased friend vowed to give her fortune to an air ambulance charity in 2014, but the charity never received those funds. Pearman was thorough in his deceit and employed the services of Alexander Yuryev Shikov and Luke Derrick, whom he designated as witnesses. They signed the letter of wishes that Pearman forged, which falsely confirmed that they had witnessed the victim sign the document. The solicitors were suspicious of the alleged letter of wishes and opened an investigation shortly. The victim's doctor confirmed that she didn't have the mental capacity to make such a big decision or sign the letter toward the end of her life. The doctor's statements prompted a further investigation into Pearman's fraudulent actions. His witnesses, Shikov and Derrick, provided affidavits where they claim they signed the letter as witnesses after the deceased signed it, but later changed their stories. They confessed to signing the letter after the victim passed away, and their confessions were critical evidence against Pearman. Law enforcement arrested Pearman and took him to court. He received a five-year and three-month prison sentence and was ordered to pay one thousand thousand eight hundred and seventy three dollars towards prosecution costs and a victim surcharge. Shikov and Derrick received suspended prison sentences and the court ordered them to perform unpaid work and make payments toward prosecution costs and a victim surcharge. This guy ripped off an old lady and a charity? His mother must be very proud. Number three, the fun in refunds. Narinder Kaur made over half a million dollars when she conned stores into giving her refunds for items she never bought. Kaur also known as Nina Tiara, would enter stores, remove items from shelves, then take them to the cash register where she claimed she had bought them and requested a refund. Cower's operation was so successful that she made it her full-time job. She defrauded retailers and traveled across the country to replicate it. Cower operated from July 2015 to February 2019 and ripped off stores at least 1,000 times. To go undetected, Cower legally changed her name and created a second identity in which she opened a new bank account and credit card. Cower targeted several several high-end stores like department stores, Debenhams, John Lewis, House of Fraser, TK Maxx, HomeSense, and more. Despite spending significantly less on actual purchases, she received massive refunds from these stores. Coward didn't just defraud retail stores, she also conned the Wiltshire Council, her local government in the UK. She used stolen credit cards to pay for services and then requested refunds from the council, claiming she accidentally put too many zeros on a payment. She worked with a male accomplice who helped her use stolen debit cards to pay for her gas bill. Police grew suspicious of Cower and opened an investigation. They used financial data, retail records, security camera footage, and witness evidence. Police found $187,000 in cash and a stack of stolen goods when they searched her home. Officers arrested Cower and she faced 26 charges, including fraud, possessing and transferring criminal property, and perverting the course of justice. After a four-month trial, jurors found her guilty of all charges. She faces significant jail time related to the scheme. Her new alias can be Nina Incarcerina. Number two, romantic gestures. 
Frederick Ugo Digi conned dozens of victims through online dating sites where he gained their trust and convinced them to send him money. Digi gained his victims' trust by love bombing, which consisted of charming his victims and making them feel special. With the help of his accomplice, Raquel Johnson, Digi formed a string of fake online relationships. Digi primarily targeted gay men, although he sometimes reached out to straight men and pretended to be a woman. Most victims were in vulnerable positions, such as suffering from poor health or being older. After a Establishing what his victims thought was a genuine connection, DG would ask for money. He would say he needed cash for his sick or deceased mother's funeral cost or to assist in the legal process of acquiring his inheritance. DG often convinced victims to give him money for his mother, who he either said was sick abroad and needed financial support for medical bills, or that she'd passed away and he had to pay for the funeral. DG also claimed that he needed money for legal fees or to invest in new business opportunities. Sometimes his stories were very elaborate, such as when he claimed he was being held by Dutch Customs, which was believable because when aren't Dutch Customs an absolute nuisance? Am I right? And alleged he had been kidnapped on at least one occasion. DG took elaborate measures to support his stories by creating false documents and travel documentation, which he would send to his victims to pressure them. Although DG claimed he just needed a loan, which he would quickly repay, none of his victims got their money back. DG's crimes lasted from January 2005 to April 2021. Over that time, he conned at least 80 victims. DG and Johnson stole at least $250,000 from five of their victims, and authorities later learned they laundered $535,000 through their accounts. They spent the money on living expenses like private dental care, gym memberships, groceries, and takeout meals. One victim came forward in 2020 after paying DG $125,000 over 14 years. Police traced the money the victim sent to DG and Johnson's home, where they found evidence of a further 179 victims of fraud. Authorities linked the pair to 80 victims of romance fraud, 22 of investment fraud, and 77 who had their identities or bank details stolen. They arrested the pair, charging DG with conspiracy to defraud, concealing criminal property, and possessing an identity document for improper means, and Johnson for supporting DG by laundering the money through her bank account. DG pleaded guilty to his charges and was jailed for eight years. Johnson pleaded guilty to one case of money laundering and was jailed for three years and nine months. After over 15 years of dedicated scamming, all DG got for his retirement is a pair of silver bracelets around his wrists. Before we get to the last case, if you're enjoying this video, be sure to stay right here for our past release about these romance scammers. Number one, nab and grab. William Lewis allegedly committed several robberies and mail theft for several months in Detroit, Michigan. According to his charges, Lewis started by stealing packages from people's porches, but progressed straight up robbing the delivery drivers. He likely was responsible for at least eight robberies and larcenies across Detroit and carried a taser or knife as he committed his crimes. Surveillance cameras caught footage of Lewis chasing a UPS driver and also picked up his car while a theft was in progress. In one incident, Lewis not only stole from a delivery driver, but after taking the package, he robbed the driver of personal items he had on him. Lewis's car was a piece of critical information for police, as it was easily recognizable and had distinguishing marks. With so much security camera footage picking up on his vehicle before, during, and after similar thefts, it was only a matter of time before law enforcement identified their suspect. The police used the security camera footage and the help of vigilant community members to locate Lewis. Many victims called the police when they realized someone had stolen their packages. Officers located Lewis at a gas station with his kids inside the vehicle. After searching the car, law enforcement found multiple pieces of evidence linking Lewis to other crimes across the city. Lewis had a prior arrest warrant but was out on bail. He re-entered police custody under a new warrant for larceny. She had gambling debts to pay off, so she became the female Tinder swindler. Then there's the woman who scammed her own supposed best friend with an imaginary uncle. Let's get right into the worst of the romance scammers. Number four, off base. Florence Massau and Mark Arom Akuo from Canton, Massachusetts, were caught defrauding people out of millions through elaborate romance scams. Four other people were involved in the scam, including four Nigerian nationals. Still, Musao and Okuo were the ringleaders and scammed their victims out of more than $1.3 million. Musao used fake identities to create profiles on dating apps and social media platforms. 
She used these aliases to find victims and lie to them about her romantic intentions. Then she swindled them out of thousands of dollars when they fell for it. She had fake passports made with the names Precious Adams and Catherine Mutoki to open bank accounts in the Boston area where her victims could deposit the funds. Rousseau's accomplices told their victims to deposit their money into her accounts. She would then withdraw the money in amounts less than $10,000 to avoid suspicion. In 2018, one of the six conspirators found a victim online and told her he was a member of the U.S. military deployed in the Middle East. He sweet-talked the woman into sending $20,000 into a Santander bank account so he could retire early and come live with her in the United States. Kuo took the same approach in his scamming. He often claimed to be a U.S. soldier in the Middle East or Africa. As the online romance with his victims developed, he claimed he was desperate to leave the military and come home, but he needed money first. In one case, a woman transferred $137,000 to an account controlled by Musao and Okuo so that Okuo could claim retirement benefits early and return to marry her. In another case, he told a woman from Georgia that he worked in the oil industry in Kuwait. However, he was in love with her and needed $4,700 to be with her in the U.S. The woman quickly wired the money to him. In 2020, Musao told a man that she was working at a United Nations refugee camp in the Middle East and wanted to come to the U.S. to start a new life with him. The victim sent her $7,800 to help her move out of the Middle East. But of course, these digital romances never materialized. Of the $1.3 million stolen, most came from romance scams. And another $20,000 came from pandemic unemployment claims. The scammers used the names of unsuspecting Massachusetts residents who were still employed and had never applied oh, for benefits. Man. Musao and Okuo were arrested on March 22nd, 2021. Musao pleaded guilty to one count of conspiracy to commit bank and wire fraud, carrying a maximum sentence of 30 years. Assistant U.S. Attorney Ian Stearns offered a plea deal that would put Musao behind bars for four to five years. Musao also forfeited $350,000 in stolen funds in addition to her 2013 Lexus sedan. Number three, words with scammers. When a widowed woman decided to pass some time on the Words with Friends mobile app, she had no idea she would be scammed out of nearly $34,000. Words with Friends is a mobile game similar to Scrabble, where you can play with your friends or random strangers as you put tiles down and play words that get you the most points. It seems relatively harmless until people with ulterior motives are matched with lonely, vulnerable players. The widowed woman from Tennessee, we'll call her Sarah, decided to download Words with Friends after her husband died earlier that year. She started playing against a man who said his name was Garth Davis, and they used the game's chat feature to get to know one another. Eventually, the friendly competition evolved into a romantic relationship. They moved the conversation to Google Hangouts where they confided in one another. Then, Garth told Sarah that he was having financial issues. He said he was a project manager on an oil rig off the coast of Ireland and couldn't access his bank account. He begged Sarah for help via cash and gift cards. She sent him thousands of dollars. A few months later, Sarah broke her foot, which made it difficult to go out and buy the gift cards for him. So he offered another option. She could send the money via wire transfers to his friend, Carla Whaley. Sarah sent him $20,000 in cash and another $3,000 through Cash App. But by July, Sarah grew suspicious and called the police. Fearing that Sarah was catfished, the cops went to Whaley's home to find this mysterious Garth Davis. But Whaley denied knowing anyone named Garth Davis. She admitted to the police that she was helping a friend move money, but wouldn't tell them who that friend was because she wasn't a rat. A few months later, police brought Whaley in for more questioning. She confessed to lying and said she received $20,000 from Sarah. Police looked at Whaley's cash app transactions and saw that she received the money, exchanged it for cryptocurrency, and then sold it for cash. Between July and August, she transferred more than $10,000 to her personal bank account. There was no Garth Davis. It had been Carla Whaley the whole time. Not only was the widowed Sarah swindled out of thousands of dollars, but she was emotionally manipulated at one of the loneliest <laughs> times in her life. Whaley was arrested in her home and brought to jail. 
She was charged with one count of fraudulent schemes and one count of financing a criminal syndicate. The lead detective on the case, Gary Kidder, said, This is a common scam, and they're not just limited to dating apps. There are a lot of warning signs to look for if you think you or someone you know may be on the verge of getting scammed. Scammers usually begin the chat by saying that they are out of the country for some reason, like work, the military, or family. This creates distance between them and the victim. Then they'll work on establishing trust before coming up with a medical problem or business emergency that leaves them desperate for money. Many victims feel a sense of loyalty and send the money, especially after chatting with the scammers for a while. But be warned, scammers are never finished asking for money. Once you send it, they'll ask again and again. If you see a loved one talking to someone online asking for money, ask how they met that person in the first place. In 2019, an estimated 25,000 people lost $201 million to romance scams. The average victim lost $2,600 each. Victims over the age of 70 lost an average of $10,000 or more. Number two, my best friend. Susan and Anna met while working at an assisted living facility. It started when Susan lent Anna a hair tie to keep her hair out of her client's food. They became fast friends and started going to nightclubs and on vacations together. But their friendship was built on lies. Anna said she was one of three triplets, two girls and a boy, but her brother died, so her biological parents put baby Anna and her sister in a plastic bag in the middle of Liverpool. Susan felt horrible for her sob story. The lies got worse when Susan said she had a crush on a nightclub bouncer named Stee. Anna quickly turned around and said that Stee was her uncle. Susan lost touch with Stee one day, eight years later, long after the club closed down. Stee called her to say he owned a business in Las Vegas and wanted a camcorder for Christmas, but his cousin Anna wouldn't get him one. He asked Susan to buy one for him. Susan didn't think this was strange because she had been getting updates from Anna about Stee over the years. Anna said Stee was recently married and divorced and had two children since he last saw Susan at the club. Things took an intense turn when Anna told Susan that Stee needed money for cancer treatment in the United States. Apparently, he was participating in experimental treatment in Maryland and Anna couldn't cover the cost herself. So, Susan agreed to cover half of it. It started at £1,000 per month and started increasing over time. Two years into the cancer scheme, Steen needed money to buy an apartment attached to the hospital for £450 per month. Susan found herself in a mounting debt she couldn't climb out of. She worked as many shifts as she could to cover Steve's treatment costs, especially since he promised a future with her once he recovered. Then, Anna's lies came crashing down. Susan realized Anna was lying when she saw her son's location wasn't in the United States where Anna said they were taking care of Steve. In December 2019, Susan had a breakdown. Her mental health was so poor that she had to move in with a friend. Susan started researching other things about Anna's life. When she called Anna's employer, a place she claimed to work for 10 years, they said they had no record of any employee named Anna. Susan researched Stee and saw no birth, death, or marriage records for anyone named Stee Lucas. Anna scammed Susan of £117,000. In Anna's house, police discovered all of the get well cards and gifts Susan sent to Stee. Anna pleaded guilty to fraud and was sentenced to 28 months in prison plus a 15 year restraining order. Even though justice might be served, Susan struggles to get over her best friend's betrayal. She has trust issues and is afraid to use public transportation. She's still so anxious that she can't work and hopes that her story will warn other potential victims of fraud. Number one, the female Tinder swindler. Jocelyn Zakur is an Australian woman who used Tinder to scam her matches out of money to pay back her gambling debts. Zakur was living the high life as a Crown Casino VIP member, but she needed more money to fuel her gambling addiction. Zakur took to Tinder to convince her matches to invest in blueberry and tobacco farms in New South Wales. One of the men was a chief executive with money to spare. He gave in to her request as they built a romantic relationship online. He sent $730,000 in 17 installments over five months. He believed his money was going towards seeds, farm worker salaries, and harvests. 
Instead, it ended up in poker machines at Melbourne's Crown Casino. But he was hesitant when she ran out of that money and asked for more. So she sent him 240 emails in three weeks that threatened his wife, mother, and children. Around the same time, Zakur convinced another financial planner to transfer $61,000 for a fruit and vegetable farm. In June 2018, she persuaded one Tinder match to send her $110,000 and another to send $50,000 on the same day. One of the men contacted the police, discovering that Zakur didn't have a blueberry, tobacco, or fruit and vegetable farm, just a gambling addiction. Zakur pleaded guilty, and a judge sentenced her to four years and eight months behind bars. Zakur appealed to reduce her sentence, arguing that the men knew what they were getting into when they matched with her on Tinder. The judge didn't buy it. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comment section what you'd rather happen. Be scammed once for $1,000 or be scammed 20 different times for $500.